Welcome back. Uh, so here at reInvent, we have thousands of startup developers here in attendance. And we're fortunate enough to have the VP of Engineering of Plaid. Uh, so can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Jean-Denis. I work at an API company in the fintech space called Plaid. Um, basically, what we do is create one common API uh, on top of every bank in the US. So uh, if you're any kind of fintech startup and you need to access uh, you need to allow your users to share their transaction history, or you need to authenticate a bank account and routing number. Uh, most likely, you'll be using Plaid to interface with the financial system. Um, cool. And uh, how big is that engineering team you have at Plaid? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're on the cusp of 50 today. We're like 47, 48. Uh, and the company as a whole is uh, effectively 110, so very like edge heavy. Um, you know, a lot of the value of what we do at the end of the day is providing a great developer experience. And uh, you know, we think of ourselves as building something for developers by developers. Cool. I definitely want to dive more into the tech side momentarily. But uh, I believe this is your first reInvent. Yes. And so I mean, there's, there's lots of people who work at startups. And they're wondering, you know, what's the value of coming to reInvent? So can you talk about kind of some of the value you see of, of being an attendee here? Yeah. I, you know, there's two, two things that stand out for me. I mean, first, obviously, like the set of talks is amazing. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably like, just the easiest way to keep on top of what's happening on top of AWS. And um, uh, number two, uh, you know, when, when I signed up to do this, literally like every company that we work with, like every third party that we work with was like, oh, we're at reInvent. Like, why don't you come by, by our booth and talk to us? And so it gives me like a just really cheap, easy way to, uh, to figure out who else we want to work with, like establish relationships. Whereas, you know, otherwise in SF, I would have to like fly to Seattle, or I'd have to go to South Bay, I'd waste a whole lot of time, and I can just do that here in a couple of days. So yeah, it's a really great event. There's a tremendous amount of networking opportunities for sure. Yeah. Um, how long have you been with Plaid? Like, what's the history of Plaid timeline was? Sure. So I've, I've been at Plaid for 11 months. You know, I'm, I'm the VP of Eng, so a lot of my role is about kind of uh, helping empower the engineering team to create the most value. Plaid itself started in 2012, and it's a, it's a pretty funny, you know, kind of typical uh, startup story in that the founders were not setting out to build Plaid. Right? They, they wanted to build a, an app to kind of help individuals manage their finances. And the first thing that they encountered, the first problem they encountered is, hey, it's really, really, really difficult to interface with banks. Like first, there's 10,000 of them, right? And none of them have a great developer experience. I mean, a lot of banks have no developer experience whatsoever. So as part of building this app, they built a library that interfaced with just like a few banks, like maybe half a dozen. Um, and the app didn't go anywhere, but they were, they were pretty plugged into the fintech scene. And other startup founders that they were talking to basically were like, hey, like, can we use your library? Like, we need to do the same thing. Like, we need to interface with these banks. We don't want to spend all this time kind of building that ourselves. Like, what if, what if we could just use yours? And basically, they immediately pivoted and decided to offer this one standard API on top of transactions, on top of authentication, on top of your like, financial identity uh, across all 10,000 banks. I mean, that's so cool. You solved this core problem that was your main problem. And it turned out to be everyone else in the industry's uh, uh, major tackle to try to solve. Yeah. I mean. I we feel like honestly today we feel very lucky. Like the, you know, you know this as 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 AWS. But the best thing about being a platform is, you know, you you see the entire ecosystem too. So you get this vantage point into like what the future looks like. Like mm -hmm. what now? It's first not very difficult to figure out what else we should build. We just look at a common problem that a lot of our users have, and we can just like get there. And so yeah, it's. Uh, it also it's speaks a lot to you know undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? Yeah. Like, why as a uh, financial company do I have to build this interface, these APIs when it's already solved? Yeah. So I can focus on building that product and that those differentiators for my my industry. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. What um, I'm really curious to know about some of the tech. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of your stack looks like, what AWS services you're using to kind yeah. of power this? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely going to like this, because we're like 99% on, on AWS. So we use, We'll get that last 1% in time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll help you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we use, uh, I mean, EC2, uh, you know, S3, Redshift, Kinesis. Parameter store, uh, and so you—you you actually, you know, you started off with traditional EC2, but um, I believe you guys are also now uh, investigating or now deploying out into ECS. Yes, that's right. I mean, we just—we—we uh, uh, we were VM-based before. We've moved to Docker, and we first—we, you know, the first step for that was to Dockerize kind of a developer environment, and that went really, really well. And now we've been switching every production service over to ECS. What are some of the benefits or, or advantages you're seeing of using, uh, you know, containerized on ECS over traditional EC2? I, it honestly just about 
like it's about empowering your developers and kind of uh, not having a hard division line between your SREs or your DevOps people and the rest of your engineering team. Because we, we want, at the end of the day, you want someone to be able to like spin up a service mm -hmm. and, and make sure that from like a security standpoint, like it's 100% safe, being able to like control the deployment story and so on and so forth. And ECS makes that like really easy for us. I mean, that, you, you raise a, a great point, which is, you know, developer culture is essential to being productive in an environment. Um, so it sounds like you're leveraging these tools to build that positive culture and, and relationship between the teams. Yeah, I mean, that's the goal. I, I think we, like, we spent a lot of energy this year trying, trying to make our, our kind of developer environment and just our speed of iteration faster. Um, it's, it's one of those things where if you, you, know, you pay attention to it, you make it great, and then if you don't keep paying attention to it, it'll, it'll kind of degrade over time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're really efficient as a team, you just don't need to hire that extra person. So sometimes it's low, lowest hanging fruit, right? As opposed to going recruiting really hard, you can just make your team more efficient, like uh, more bottom up, more empowered. Any like tips or guidance you'd give other people of similar size, team wise, or maybe smaller, who are trying to build like that? I mean, f like f from a cultural perspective, yes. I think. I think for, for, for DevOps, honestly, every company runs pretty differently. Right. I think one thing that's missing actually in that space right now is just a, like a clear idea of what best practices are. You know, I, the, the company that I worked at before, before Plaid did things very, very differently. Right. And, and I think the way Plaid does it is very different. Some, some companies are their VPs that I, that I know. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of some technological choices that we make back in the day. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of path dependence. Uh, so yeah, I think the advice is more like per company. Because there are also like you know the traditional patterns you see, right? Like uh, certain problems are solved or architected a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely like a well-architected framework we have, which helps give guidance on that. Um, but I'm, yeah, um, yeah. So one thing I'm also kind of curious about is uh, you talk about like improving your speed of um, innovation and being able to deploy faster. Mm -hmm. So any sense of just how much quicker you're now deploying with those improvements to your culture and your architecture? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there, there's some things that are like 5x the speed that they used to be, or the things that are just 20% faster. It depends on the services. There are just some services that were very cumbersome to deploy that we've made much faster. Right? You, you, have, you build a company, especially a startup, right? you, you build a company over four years, and initially your goal is just product market fit. Huh. Right, and you're not necessarily thinking about building right, you're thinking about like, building quick. Huh. Right? And then over time, that, that, that kind of switches. And so there's, there's old parts of, of Plaid that aren't touched that much that are like, they're very stable, they're very secure, but deploying kind of sucks, but we, the incentive to fix that is not, is not immediate, right? Because we're not touching those services that much. What about uh, the realm of serverless and Lambda? Yeah, so that's been, I would say, uh, we've, um, we've recently had a couple, we, we didn't use Lambda until maybe six months ago, um, and we're having two really cool use cases around it. Uh, one of them is for like an internal kind of support server that we have that frankly just like managing another service would make no sense for something that would just be sitting on a couple of boxes anyway. Mm -hmm. Like Lambda just means that we don't have to worry about that at all. Mm -hmm. The second one which is interesting, and I think this is more of a blog post and I don't want to scoop the engineers that are working <laughs> about on it, but we have, uh, the way we, we, we issue certificates internally right now is run in like a hundred line of code, like little like, like Lambda shell and it, it leverages parameter store, leverages like some of the roles and it's, it's really fantastic. And it's one of those things where for us, we could have been like running Vault, uh, great company, but like we could have been running Vault or just having like Lambda like take care of this this uh, issuing certificates for us, and that's just like a, a much yeah. I mean, Vault is fantastic, but to have to build and manage three servers for a cluster yeah. of console, and then uh, when all you want to do is run 100 lines of code, like yeah. Lambda is a perfect fit for that. So I think now it, what we've seen and we saw that with Kinesis, which we use Kinesis initially for billing, and now we're using it for kind of our monitoring pipeline. Uh, and I think what we're seeing with Lambda too is that once you get the team used to like kind of using these these services, it's very, you, you just come up, you start using it as, as a solution to other problems that I encounter. I'm not saying that it's like, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, like we're being okay. thoughtful about it, but uh, they're good tools to have in your belt. And you mentioned uh, using Kinesis for building a monitoring system. Um, can you talk yeah. a little bit about, about that system? Yeah, I, I generally would not advocate building kind of services uh, from scratch that often. I think, uh, and I, I don't want to talk actually too much about what we're doing there, the, the TLDR is, you know, our foundation is 10,000 banks, so right. the source of truth for the data that we have is distributed across effectively 10,000 databases that we, that we don't control, right? right. And, and 
we integrate with these banks in a number of ways, and it's very difficult for us to tell if maybe a bank changed their API, or uh -huh. if they're having routine maintenance, or if they're down, or if they changed the provider of their API, whatnot. Like, it's, it's hard for us to tell. So we really felt compelled to having our own monitoring solution that could kind of try to identify these trends, and that's kind of a work in progress, and that's one of the reasons why we're like, we think we need to build this in-house, because none of the existing solutions could kind of take care of this kind of weird this weird monitoring problem. I mean, it's pretty rare that you build a company where you don't control your underlying infrastructure. Like, that's one of the core hard problems that we have to solve at Plaid, and uh, yeah. That's cool, and so now you have Kinesis doing this aggregation of all these events across tens of thousands of banks, and then, um, so you're using like a, a read once, write many model at that point, and? Uh, it, I mean, it depends, but yes, yes. I mean, that's what it's really good for. Yep, um, so, so one thing I love about finance companies is obviously security is of a concern, which is why you know, you're very sensitive on talking about some topics, and yeah. I totally understand that. Well, um, are there any like, basic principles or guidelines you can give to people, or, or how you think philosophically about building secure applications yeah. that you can share? Yeah, so I'm just going to step back. I, I want to talk about both like, privacy and security yep. there. Like, I think, um, you know, if you think about Plaid, from a developer perspective, right, we're this really easy to use API. But from an end consumer perspective, every time you sign up for one of these services, you're basically going through a, a flow where you find your bank and you log in into it, and yeah. we provide that flow, mm -hmm. right? And, and that flow, it's, it's like, imagine it, it's like log in with Facebook or log in with Google before your bank account. That's provided by us. So the first thing with us is because we're having all these consumer touch points, at first it's a mix of security and privacy. Right. It's a mix of security because you need to get that consumer to feel really comfortable like sharing this very sensitive information, both with the end app and then with us as a conduit. Hmm. But it's also a, pri it's a privacy concern, right? Because you, you, want, you, want to, you want that person to feel like they control where their data is going. Like hmm. they know where it's going. They understand how the whole thing works. Hmm. Um, and so I think for us, like, we think about it as like half of it is education, right? Half of it is you need to get the end consumer to really comfortable with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then and then more on the security front, there's like two things that 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 we care a lot about. Like one of them is if you have sensitive information, you just encrypt it. And you really, really limit the services or especially the people within your org that can access that information. Mm -hmm. Right? That's that's rule like rule number zero. And there's a lot of cool tricks that you can use, like uh, um, you know, you can uh, um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but you know, there's things that you can do with tombstoning and having like per record encryption keys, which which uh, like you know provide you not just with the initial like security kind of conditions that you care about, but also like down the line uh, being able to like delete the PII like in a 100% easy way, where you're you're sure there's not some PII that's lying in some like log statement or some like mm -hmm. Redshift instance somewhere. Um, the second part for us that's really important is we have relationships with banks, and effectively the banks care so much about consumer security, and they which I'm you know, so thankful for. Yeah, yes, and, and they audit us, right? We we were partners with them, right? So so I think you know it's something from from day one at Plaid, like security was like a core part of of the company. We not only have like a very good security team, um, but we also have like every engineer really has to care about it. Can you talk about how the security team works with the developers? Um, that's a, like, what's that relationship yeah. like? Like, how do you how do you educate or train a new developer who comes into your environment who might not have had like a fintech background in the past? Sure. Actually, I don't. Yeah, I think the I don't know if there's like a, I, all these things for me like they boil down to culture. Like, mm -hmm. you won't. We don't have a security team and an engineering team. We mm -hmm. just we just have like an engineering team. Some people are security experts, right? They did security at Google and they did security, you know, at Facebook or they did like security at Blizzard or whatnot. And they're part of the team. So they'll be writing code, right? Mm -hmm. But they'll also be doing code reviews. They'll be as part of every, um, every time we write, uh, like architect a new system, they'll be part of that conversation from day one. And you just, you just want a culture where it, it's kind of the same with DevOps, where any engineer can go talk to someone from the SRE DevOps team. Anyone can go and talk to the security team. The security team is looped in about everything that's going on. Yep. Um, I think that's, that's the baseline. After that, you know, there's like things around bounty programs and whatnot that you want to manage really, really well. But like culturally, it's about like developing that trust. And what what I've seen fail is like a throw it over the wall kind of, yeah, of course. kind of philosophy, or a philosophy where like security really wants to do something, and then you're like, oh well, we don't have the engineering resources to do that, so we're not going to do it. Like that just that's a non-starter, right? You you need to you need to not feel like oh this is a security engineering team problem. It's like it's a plaid wide problem. It's an org wide problem. Yeah, I mean security is every developer's responsibility, and yep. like yeah, as soon as you as soon as you say my line of responsibility is right here, and security someone else is going to take care of it, it builds such a yeah, yeah, me versus them. You can like there, you know you also you make a lot of choices. So you know if you're if you're all on AWS, right? 
Like there's certain there's certain parts of the security problem that kind of disappear for you that that, that Amazon is managing for you, right? Can you so, elaborate on this a little bit? Well, just just in terms of like like ACLs and like what uh -huh. can each service access? Like it's just very clear, and you you can't get around it, right? You either do it everywhere or you don't. Uh -huh. um, and so I think you you end up you know you end up you have a trade off between like the things that you have to worry more about and the things that you trust Amazon with. Excellent. And the shared security model makes it very easy to say, you know, we're, we'll take care of everything with the hypervisor all the way down, and then you yeah. can focus on building a secure application on top of it, yeah. which is really, really nice. Um, can you kind of like walk me through what the first day or first week of an engineer on your team is like? Like, how do you how do you onboard them? How do you ramp them up to this environment? How do you get them used to yeah. your tools? Yeah. So it, it's pretty straightforward. Everyone who joins, I mean, we have like a week long, uh, like kind of set of onboarding lectures, uh, and some of the onboarding lectures are apply to everybody at the company, right? like compliance or uh, kind of security around your account credentials and so on and so forth. And then part of the, um, you know, part of the onboarding is engineering specific, and that has like a security segment for sure. Hmm. Um, what we then do is, it's not just about the onboarding your first week, is the first part of the code that you're going to touch when you join Plaid right. is actually our bank integrations, which is, it's like the, it's, you know, this is like the, the foundation on which everything is built. Right. Um, and I think that, that is the place that is, that interacts with, honestly, like the, more, the, the most sensitive part of, uh, of our system. And it's a, it's, it's a place where we pay a lot of attention through code reviews and so on. So we're kind of starting you with uh, something that's like very complicated, mm -hmm. uh, but with a lot of handholding to make sure you learn from the ground up, like how to care about security and privacy from day one. And then afterwards, whatever else you work on is going to be, by definition, like m more simple for you to, to deal with. What about uh, going a little further um, ahead of that whole pipeline and actually getting good candidates or hiring? Like any recommendations or any, anything you see on what makes like a good interview for you guys and how you find yeah. good engineering talent? I mean, like you, as a company where you play your strengths. So like I say this and I, just, I don't want to disparage other companies, but I think Plaid is in a unique place in terms of having very hard infrastructure and backend problems. Um, and the advantage of being a platform, right, is like if we build something, it'll be used by, like you were saying before, hundreds if not thousands of apps. Like my favorite part about Plaid is in the morning I come in and I look at a dashboard, and it has a number, which is the number of accounts that have been linked in the next last 24 hours, and then I have a list of our top 40 companies. Mm -hmm. And every couple of weeks, there's a company in the top 40 that I've never heard of, right? And I look them up and I find out that they're doing something really cool, like helping people save money on their credit card bills or helping people, uh, you know, like apply for mortgages and, and so on. And it's like. Like, that's super empowering, and there just aren't a lot of companies that are platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk to like really strong backend engineers, like they realize a lot of places they would get hired, they wouldn't be driving that much value for the company. Whereas us, like for us, backend data quality, like that's the core value that we offer, mm -hmm. and that makes it that makes it easy to attract a specific kind of candidate, which just happens to be the kind of candidate that we want, right? Mm -hmm. And the second thing that's a big advantage for us is we're like in a very very good competitive situation, which we're like by far the market leader. I mean, if you, you could almost name any like FinTech app and they're most likely using us. And so, you know, th there's other fields where they're interesting technical problems, but there's a lot of competition. Like one that comes to mind always for me is like the analytics space. Really hard technical problem in the analytics space, but there's so many companies doing it. So I think if you mix like a really good business case, uh, really hard technical problems that require great engineers, like suddenly uh, you find that naturally you're attracting really good candidates. And we, you know, we've done it. We've got a lot of good engineers from, like, uh, from Dropbox or from Square, uh, you know, from Facebook or from Google, and they've come because they're excited about, about the impact that they can have. And uh, um, yeah, I, th I, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to jinx myself. Like, I think we've had a really, really strong year in, in recruiting. Also, you know, we're 50 engineers. So even if we you know, want to double over like 12 to 18 months, that's not, we're not hiring like hundreds of people, and we can be very specific and targeted in who we look for. And this is a perfect moment to close by plugging the engineering blog so people can read more about you know, some of the challenges you're tackling. So yeah. what's the engineering blog URL? Uh, actually, is it, I, I want to say plaid.com slash engineering. Blog. Or you can just search even, it, I'm sure it's. I actually don't even know, but, uh, but it's good. There's actually a really good piece on uh, our use of machine learning, which you should check out. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us. Really cool. appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.